Thank you, Yadong, and thank you all for, uh, for, uh, for coming back after lunch. Um, the Glads at the Gladstone Institutes, as you heard this uh, morning, uh, we've started this Roddenberry Stem Cell Center, uh, but it's probably important to, to recognize that really what sets our uh, center apart is that this stem cell center is layered on top of uh, some fabulous basic and translational science in three specific disease areas. Cardiovascular disease, which will be the subject of the talk I'll give today, uh, but also neurological diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and Huntington's, as well as viral diseases like AIDS and hepatitis C. And it's this combination of stem cell biology approaches and this deep knowledge of disease that I think has, has really allowed us to do uh, some unique things, particularly in the area of reprogramming where we've been able to leverage IPS technology for disease modeling, but also uh, to be able to uh, reprogram cells directly, as you'll hear uh, in a moment. Now, my background is actually as a pediatric cardiologist. And so for 15 years in my laboratory, we've studied the disease that you see here, which is a child who's born with the heart malformation. And this disease is really a problem of a cell fate decision that goes awry very early during development as a cell's uh, cardiac cell fate is being determined. And so it's our hope that if we could figure out the networks that instruct an early embryonic cell to become a heart cell, that we might understand this disease, but that it might also instruct us in new ways to address this disease, which is very different, and this is the adult form of heart disease, where essentially heart muscle dies after a heart attack, and the heart has little, if any, capacity to regenerate itself. And so the only way to really address this problem is to somehow be able to create new muscle. And so far, that's been extremely challenging uh, even though we've been able to create, make stem, uh, cardiac cells from stem cells, it's been difficult to uh, introduce these and have them uh, integrate with their neighbors. Nevertheless, we thought that if we could understand how nature normally makes a heart cell, that we might be able to redeploy that network and that system in the adult to create new muscle. And what I'll show you is that we've been able to some degree now do exactly that. And so the story really begins with going back to learning what nature does. And on this slide, uh, I've depicted some of the morphogenetic steps that occur as a heart is being formed in an embryo. And it's by working out the molecular networks that guide the early cell fate decisions as early as two weeks of gestation in the human with subsequent morphogenetic events that result in the four-chambered heart that we've really been able to create a intricate network of, of genes that control this process. And by utilizing both uh, animal models as well as stem cell models to address this problem, we can now begin to assemble uh, genes that are important in different, for development of different cell types that make up the heart, indicated here in yellow, uh, red, or blue. And these just indicate the networks that, some of the networks that we know of. But the main point here is that, to appreciate that we can assemble these factors in some hierarchical fashion and in some network. And most of the factors here are actually transcription factors. And our laboratory has found over the years that there's, a deep, there's an equally complex network of microRNAs that titrate these exact same networks and are embedded within these same transcriptional networks. And it's been satisfying to find then that these are in fact the networks and genes that are mutated in the setting of human congenital heart malformations. And I've indicated those genes with asterisks that we know are mutated in the setting of human disease and, and cause congenital heart malformations. And you'll see that each of these pathways is hit one or more times. And we know that some of these actually form a comp, some of these proteins form complexes. And so we had tried to use mouse models to understand the mechanisms by which, which these genes cause human disease, but we reached a limit because the mouse model simply didn't recapitulate the human disease fully. And so it was with the discovery of IPS technology that really allowed us to get to the next level in understanding and exploring disease mechanisms by making, being able to make IPS cells from humans with specific genetic mutations. And our laboratory had identified uh, the genetic mutations shown here, uh, two of which we've published, one of which we haven't as yet, but mutations in notch one uh, can cause uh, calcific aortic valve disease, and mutations in GATA4 uh, can cause a cardiomyocyte differentiation and maintenance problem. And so we've gone back now and made 
iPS cells from uh, 10 or so individuals in each one of these families, individual families across multiple generations. And uh, you'll hear in a later talk from uh, one of our Roddenberry fellows, uh, Kimberly Cordes, uh, who will give a short talk at the end of this session, uh, her efforts in uh, uh, making uh, smooth muscle cells from patients with mutations in elastin. Um, I just want to mention briefly uh, the family that I alluded to that had mutations in GATA4, which is shown here. So this is a large pedigree. It's across five generations. There are 16 or so people on this slide who are affected with disease, indicated in red or black. And they had holes in their heart. And a subset of the family actually developed a cardiomyopathy uh, and uh, have developed heart failure. And in the process of mapping this genetic mutation, which we did with traditional genetic linkage analysis, we found that there was a point, single point mutation in GATA4, so it changed one amino acid, uh, that had resulted in 100% penetrance of disease. And this single amino acid is highly conserved. It's a glycine residue across evolution, all the way down to fruit flies and even the yeast ortholog of this protein. And that residue sits right next to the second zinc finger of GATA4, which is a zinc finger transcription factor. And this zinc finger is known to be important for DNA binding, but also for protein-protein interactions. And it was based on this mutation and the phenotype of holes in their heart in this family, and the recognition that another human mutation of a gene called TBX5 that's been studied by Benoit Bruneau, who you'll hear from tomorrow, also results in the exact same type of cardiac disease that uh, Irfan Kathiria, some years ago when he was a student in my lab, asked the question of whether these two proteins actually might physically interact with one another. And that turned out to be the case, and that we, we now know that these two proteins sit together on DNA binding sites and activate a downstream transcription that's important for normal cardiogenesis. And we found that this point mutation in GATA4 disrupted GATA4's ability to bind DNA and also disrupted its ability to interact with TBX5. And I'll come back to this uh, point in a moment, but it illustrates how, much like in the stem cell IPS field, many of the key transcription factors physically connect with one another in an interactome that then is essential for the downstream function. So we are moving forward with modeling these diseases by making endothelial cells, smooth muscle cells, and cardiac cells. But I want to turn our attention now to another type of cell in the heart that's completely different, and that is the cardiac fibroblast population, which has an independent uh, embryonic origin. And it turns out that in the heart, somewhat unique compared to other organs, fully 50% of the cells in the adult heart are, in fact, fibroblast cells, not muscle cells. And so based on, inspired by the discovery of the IPS field and the notion that one could alter a cellular fate from a fibroblast to a stem cell, uh, we asked, might we be able to make these fibroblasts do something that they don't normally do? And what they normally do is, uh, is make scar cells in the heart. And instead of, uh, after injury, instead of having these cells make scar, uh, Masaki Eda asked, could we somehow divert them into thinking that they should become cardiac muscle cells? And so the idea is shown here is that instead of a scar forming after a heart attack, uh, as would be indicated here, uh, and this, these, this fibrotic tissue is laid down by fibroblast, instead of scar forming, what if we could take those same fibroblasts and divert them and have them not lay down as much scar, but rather become new muscle, then we might be able to regenerate the heart from within and take advantage of this vast pool of cells that already exist within the organ. So I'm going to summarize a, a long story that we published two years ago in this one slide and then share with you some of our newest work. And th this slide depicts the fact that, in fact, we were able to uh, do exactly this. And it turned out that it was much like in the IPS area, it didn't take a huge number of factors. It just took three key transcription factors to be able to convert a cardiac fibroblast into a cardio cardiac myocyte-like cell. And two of these factors, the ones that I mentioned before that I told you were very important in cardiac development and human disease, GATA4 and TBX5. And a third factor is MEF2C, which we also knew in every animal species we had studied was essential for cardiogenesis. And so 
it turned out that there are three factors together somehow was able, were able to initiate a genome-wide shift in transcription such that thousands of cardiac-like genes were upregulated and a similar number of fibroblast genes were downregulated. This event was epigenetically stable uh, in that uh, the histone marks and DNA methylation marks at certain loci were, uh, were uh, created, and we could withdraw the expression of these three factors and the phenotype would be maintained. They assembled quite nice sarcomeres and developed calcium transients, but it turned out that all 10 to 15 percent of the fibroblast cells adopted this state. Only a very small fraction of this population, only less than 1 percent of this population, actually went on to become more fully reprogrammed, more fully reprogrammed, uh, and uh, could actually go to uh, a beating stage. And for cardiac myocytes, we have a very rigorous test of whether a cell is fully reprogrammed or not, and that is that it should actually beat either spontaneously or with electrical stimulation. And so we think that this state might be somewhat similar to what's been described in the IPS field, where we might have a larger percentage of cells that are reprogrammed to the point where they're self-renewing, they're expressing pluripotency markers, but only a fraction of those go on to become fully reprogrammed in that they can give rise to a mouse. And so it's possible that these are pre-induced cardiac myocytes, if you, we use a similar terminology. Uh, and just as uh, it's been shown that these pre-IPS cells can be converted chemically into fully reprogrammed cells, uh, it occurred to us that maybe there are ways in which changing the scenario in these cells could push them to a more fully reprogrammed state. And it turns out that uh, that is the case. And the in vivo microenvironment of the organ, of the heart, has, has the capability to push these cells to become a much more fully reprogrammed uh, cell type. And that's what I'll show you next. And this was the work uh, done by Lee Chian, who uh, was a postdoc in the lab and now has, has her own lab at the University of North Carolina. And the first question she had to ask was, could these three factors even reprogram cells in the organ, because so far we had only shown this, that we could do this in the dish by overexpressing these three genes. And so to do this and to ask the question whether or not the fibroblast cells within the organ can convert into a muscle cell, one has to be able to genetically lineage trace and mark those fibroblast cells that are already in the organ. And so she did this using a, the genetic trick shown here, crossing a a uh, transgenic mouse where Cree recombinase was under the control of the periostin promoter. And periostin is a fibroblast enriched uh, gene, but not, there's no fibroblast specific gene. But importantly, it's never expressed in the muscle, even after injury. And by crossing that with a Rosa lock stop lox lax z mouse, uh, any cell that was expressing periostin, i.e., a fibroblast cell, uh, would take out this stop signal and now would be laxy positive and express in beta-gal protein, which we, then we can mark. And so by using this combination of transgenic mouse, uh, Lee induced an injury in the mouse heart by tying off the coronary artery and mimicking a heart attack. And then uh, using a retroviral system, directly injected the three transcription factors into the muscle. And we used the retrovirus specifically for proof of concept studies because we know that the retrovirus can only be taken up by dividing cells, and cardiomyocytes don't divide. And so it would only be the non-myocyte population that would have these three, take up and express these three factors. And so subsequently, after if we then look at the mouse uh, some weeks later, if a muscle cell is beta-gal positive, it should be a new, newly born muscle cell or an induced cardiac myocyte. And if it's beta-gal negative, it should be one of the pre-existing old cardiac myocytes. Now, there are two ways that we could uh, be misled in this strategy. And one is if the periostin Cre is leaky and is expressed in muscle cells. So we did careful studies to make sure that was not the case. And the other way is if there was a cell fusion event that was common where a fibroblast cell that would be beta-gal positive would fuse with a muscle cell then a brand new muscle cell would be present, would, a, new, a muscle cell would be present that would be, be beta gal positive, and we could be fooled into thinking that that was a newly reprogrammed when it would really be a fusion event. So I won't show you the data as it's published, but we've ruled out the possibility that what I'll show you next is from a, from a fusion event. Uh, and so we move forward, and I'll show you now the results 
of uh, our experiments that were recently published. So what you see here is sections of a mouse heart four weeks after the experiment I described to you on the last slide. And this is a section through the area of injury. Uh, and here we've stained, when using a retrovirus expressing a controlled DS-RED, if we stain with alpha-actinin, there are no muscle cells in this section because this is the area where the cells have died. There are beta-gal positive cells in this section, as you see here, uh, but no muscle cells. In contrast, in the comparable region in mice where we've injected these three factors, we now see uh, alpha-actinin positive cells that start to look like myocytes. Here's the beta-gal stain, and here's the overlay. And if I zoom in on this, uh, I think you can appreciate that there are cells here that are both red and green, suggesting that uh, these are cells that are newly reprogrammed and used to be of non-myocyte origin. Now, sometimes on a section of a heart, we can be fooled, again, into thinking that there are two cells on different layers uh, that look like they co-express a gene. In addition, we can't really interrogate individual cells at, when they're alive through this method. And so what Lee did was to do this experiment again, uh, and this time, after four weeks, take the hearts out, put them in a hanging heart prep, and then disperse the heart into a dish at the single cell level. So now we could look at individual cells and interrogate the, and characterize individual cells. So this is what these cells look like. Uh, the non-red cells here are the, the pre-existing myocytes, and this cell represents one of the, what we think is a newly born cardiac myocyte. And this cell looks pretty good, and it turns out that about half the cells look this good, and the other half are somewhere along the way of looking this good, but are in, appear to be incompletely reprogrammed. And this is another uh, look at these. Now we've stained these with uh, alpha-actinin again. And what you see on your left is a green cell stained with alpha-actinin, and on your right is a yellow cell because it's expressing both alpha-actinin and beta-gal, making us think this is a newly reprogrammed cell. And you can see that it has these nice striations of sarcomeres similar to the endogenous cardiac myocyte, and we can bin and score what percent of these cells are really good, which is about half, uh, and then about a third of the cells have sarcomeres that develop through about half of the cell, but not all the way through, and then about another 15% really just express alpha-actinin, but haven't assembled very nice sarcomeres at all. And we can trace the development of these uh, categories uh, over time in the mouse by sacrificing mice at one week, two week, three week, and four week time periods and seeing that we get a greater and greater shift to what we call these class four reprogrammed cells. And if we look at the uh, these cells by electron microscopy, they look something like this. Uh, on your left is an endogenous cardiac myocyte. These are the mitochondria and these are the sarcomeric units between this line and this line. And here you can see that these, uh, in the induced cardiac myocyte, the sarcomeres are really well aligned in about half the cells. In the other half, they have some disarray and are not fully aligned. But they have abundant mitochondria, and they look quite similar, although they're not exactly the same as the endogenous cardiac myocyte. And if we look at these uh, groups of these individual cells that we can culture and look at uh, by uh, PCR at a specific set of genes shown here, uh, we see that there's a shift in gene expression as well. So here are about 20 genes. Uh, at the top are cardiac-enriched genes up to here, and these are fibroblast-enriched genes. And so if we look in cardiac fibroblast cells in three different populations, you see this pattern. Here are endogenous uh, cardiac myocytes here in these two lanes, and you can see there's a big significant shift. And here in the last three lanes are induced cardiac myocytes. And you can see that not only are they very similar to the endogenous cardiac myocytes, uh, but the levels of expression of these cardiac genes are also very similar. And if we look more globally at the transcriptome, uh, it looks something like this, where here you have the cardiac fibroblasts uh, by microarray, looking at the transcriptome. And the cardiac myocytes, of course, are different in this region, and all these are different as well. Now, if we looked at... Uh, in vivo cardiac, induced cardiac myocytes, like what I've shown you by injection in vivo, these look like something like this. So they're still not identical to the cardiac myocytes, but they're pretty similar. And they're more similar than these three lanes, which are the in vitro derived cardiac myocytes that I described to you earlier, have a much higher percentage of the incompletely reprogrammed cell type. And so you can see that this difference between these 
lanes and these lanes indicate, I think, the improvement that the in vivo microenvironment provides. Now, here's the ultimate test, though. As, as I mentioned, only a tiny fraction of the in vitro reprogrammed cells on plastic could beat. Here, we've done the experiment again now with crossing the periostin Cree with the Rosa GFP uh, mouse so that we don't have to fix these cells to look at the beta-gal expression, but rather can see which are the newly reprogrammed cells with, in, the live, in live cells by GFP. And here is a pre-existing non-GFP positive myocyte, and here is a GF, or GFP positive cells. And you can see that with electrical stimulation, these cells beat in a very similar manner to uh, the endogenous cardiac myocyte. And fully 50% of the cells, when we isolate them in this single cell prep, uh, are, look like this, consistent with the phenotype I described you, to you earlier. So this was very encouraging and suggested that whether it's the mechanical forces that are imposed in vivo uh, or the extracellular matrix proteins or secreted proteins, uh, the in vivo mi in vi microenvironment uh, is much more powerful. Now, because these were live cells, we could put a needle into these and look at the electrophysiology of these. And this is, we did a lot of studies. Uh, Ian Spencer did these at our place. And this is just one example of the action potential pattern of the endogenous uh, cardiac myocyte from the same heart prep. So this would be a YFP negative cell uh, from the same mouse. And it looks something like this in the shape. And this is the YFP positive induced cardiac myocyte. And you can see that they're very similar. And also, if we measure various kinetics, they're very similar. But a, a cardiac muscle cell has to not only beat, but in order to do anything useful, it has to electrically integrate with its neighbors. If it doesn't do that, it won't beat in synchrony with the rest of the heart, and we won't actually get any increased force generation and cardiac output. And so this is a challenging experiment, uh, but Ian managed to do this. And this is to try to see if two cells, a new cell and an old cell, could not only touch, but also conduct electricity across them and beat in unison. And so for this experiment, Ian uh, did the same thing as I described to you before, but this time didn't do single cell preparations, but rather clusters of cells of two or three cells in a dish. And here up, up top, you'll see three cells. Only number, cell number two is a reprogrammed cell, and these two are pre-existing cells. And if uh, he induces a calcium uh, transient in cell one, within 100 milliseconds, that appears to be transmitted to cells two and three. And so in this still image, it appears that these are electrically coupled. And I'll show you a movie down here that also has three cells. This is a different cluster. Here's cell one, two, and three, and only this red cell is reprogrammed. I'm going to play the movie now, and you'll see this uh, calcium wave that starts in one cell over here and then propagates through these other two cells quite rapidly. And that's shown here. So you can see that this uh, calcium wave gets propagated uh, very quickly, suggesting that these are, in fact, electrically coupled cells. So what I've shown you so far is that with a combination of three transcription factors, we can reprogram uh, fibrobl cardiac fibroblasts in vivo into what look like new cardiac myocytes. They electrically connect with one another, and they, and they beat, of course. And so the next question we asked is, even in this crude delivery fashion that I showed you so far, and I'm sure there are better ways we can do this, in this crude delivery fashion, can we do it well enough to even make a difference in uh, the cardiac output with each beat? And so uh, Lee and a, a very talented uh, uh, surgeon in our group, Yu Wang, uh, did many of these in vivo experiments that I'll show you next to look at function. So what they did is they did echocardiograms uh, to look at the baseline cardiac function on a large cohort of mice. We've done over 300 now in a variety of groups. Uh, did the coronary ligation, added the three factors with the retrovirus, uh, along with a, a DS red dye to mark the cells that took up the retrovirus. And then at serial time points, indicated here, we looked at the cardiac function by echocardiography. And after three months, before sacrificing the mice, we did MRIs, which are the most accurate way to look at cardiac function in this model. And I'll just show you the MRI results here at three months. Uh, this is the cross-section of a, a representative image of the MRI in diastole, when the heart's relaxed, and in systole, when the ventricle contracts. And the circle you see here represents the ventricle, and the white is the cavity of the blood in this chamber. And you can see with contraction in the control setting, just with DS red but not reprogramming factors after injury, there's some reduction in the amount of white in the ventricle that represents the blood that was ejected. In contrast with the three factors, 
I think you can appreciate on, in this image that the reduction is much greater, suggesting that more blood has been ejected. And when we quantify that, and I'll just draw your attention to this panel of the cardiac output, uh, we had a significant difference. The dash line here represents what a normal mouse would be without injury. The white bar represents a mouse with injury with only control treatment, and it's depressed. And here is the uh, experimental setting across uh, 10 different mice, and this was all blinded. And you can see that this is not quite normal, of course, but it's significantly improved than in the control setting. And this is, if we do sections through these hearts, this looks something like this, where unlike the control setting where in the left ventricle cavity shown here, there's a large area of scar, here there's still a thin wall ventricle, but now you can appreciate some muscle scattered throughout this scarred area. And if we quantify the area of scar across the heart, it looks, the reduction with these three factors looks something like this across a number of mice. Now the question is, are these muscle cells that are residual now here in this scarred area, were they just leftover muscle that somehow were protected and uh, didn't die? Or do they migrate in from the outside? Or in fact, are they newly born muscle? And to ask this question, we went back and did the same experiment, but now in this transgenic mouse where the, the formerly non-myocytes, largely fibroblasts, are label labeled with LAC-Z. So here's another heart after being treated, and here is a cluster of uh, muscle cells in the scarred area. They stain positively for alpha-actinin. And if we now co-stain with beta-gal, you can see that these alpha-actinin positive cells are also beta-gal positive, suggesting that these are newly reprogrammed cells. And if we zoom in on some of these cells, I think you can easily appreciate that in fact these cells uh, express both beta-gal and alpha-actinin and have quite beautiful sarcomeres throughout uh, the cell, suggesting that these are fully reprogrammed uh, myocytes. And so, what I've shown you is that these three factors uh, in vivo uh, can do a, a wonderful job in converting the endogenous pool of cardiac fibroblasts, at least a subset of them, into new, newly born cardiac myocytes. And so we're very excited about this uh, and are now looking at ways that we can make it even better in vitro and in vivo uh, by screening for secreted proteins that might improve the process, uh, microRNAs, as well as small molecules in collaboration with Sheng Ding uh, to find things that might improve the process. And, and to some degree, we've reached success uh, with uh, some of these approaches and are now testing those, uh, their mechanisms. Now, one of these I'll tell you about, which is a secreted protein that our lab had studied many years ago called thymosin beta-4, which is a, a small 40 amino acid peptide uh, that is an actin binding protein. And we had found some years ago uh, promotes uh, cardiac repair through a variety of mechanisms. And so we asked whether or not the combination of thymosin beta-4 and these three reprogramming factors might further improve the reprogramming process. And in fact, that turned out to be the case, and I'll just show you one slide of this. Uh, here is, a, the, again, the control uh, setting. This is with uh, thymosin beta-4, like we showed it many years ago, had very potent cardiac protective and cardiac repair effects. And here is the two together, uh, the reprogramming factors and thymosin beta-4. And this is if we quantify the scar area across many mice, you can see that the combination is better than either one uh, alone and certainly much better than in the control setting. And so we think that there may be many different ways where we can improve the technology. And in fact, uh, other groups now uh, including Eric Olson's group uh, has shown, and others have shown that addition of yet other factors can make this process uh, even better in vitro and possibly even in vivo. Um, and so where are we headed with this now? We're uh, moving this forward with the support of CIRM it, to do uh, trials, preclinical trials in larger animals such as pigs that have a heart that's more similar in size and physiology to ours. Um, and at the same time, as we explore this uh, efficacy in a large heart and safety, we're very interested in understanding the mechanisms by which these three factors can sit on DNA and initiate this self-fulfilling network that fundamentally alters the fate of the cell. And to this end, uh, Emily Berry, a student in our lab, has uh, created a, a, knock a mouse, transgenic mouse, where she's taken these three factors and tagged them uh, with uh, separate tags and knocked it into 
the Rosa locus and generated germline transmission of this, uh, this uh, targeted locus uh, in mice. And so now we have transgenic mice where we can activate these three factors at will and then do chip seek studies to see where they're actually sitting on DNA in a temporal fashion and begin to understand how this network is established. And what we found so far is that this, the transcriptome changes actually are initiated very early and uh, occur, start to occur within uh, days of activation of these factors. And uh, here you can see that in this transgenic mouse and using fibroblasts from these trans this transgenic mouse, uh, when we turn it on, uh, these factors on, we can begin to uh, actually see cardiac uh, gene expression and we're now working to refine this to get, uh, see how good cardiac myocytes we can get in this system. And uh, so with that, I'd like to close and uh, thank the members of the laboratory that I have the privilege of working with. Uh, I've tried to highlight uh, some of the members who, whose work I shared with you, but uh, everything we do is uh, really a team effort in our laboratory. And uh, even those who aren't working directly on the projects I've shared with you uh, have always contributed greatly to the intellectual environment and uh, the ideas uh, that have resulted in the work that I shared with you. And with that, I'll close and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Deepak. Uh, right on time. So now this uh, presentation open to uh, questions. Hi, hi Deepak. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I, I have one question. When you showed us the uh, lax Z positive cells, it seemed like it was a relatively small island in the midst of the heart. And I was trying to get a sense of, do you think that these factors may improve cardiac function independent of reprogramming fibroblasts? And what is the percentage of induced cardiac myocytes in vivo? Are we talking about 1% or 10%? Because the EF improvement is quite remarkable. That, that's a great question. I should have mentioned that. Uh, so we've counted the cells, and we get anywhere from 30 to 50,000 new cells in the system with this type of delivery. Uh, and while there are clearly a, a good number of myocytes that are there, uh, we do think that it's unlikely that the significant improvement that we see in function is entirely attributable to new myocyte generation. And so uh, we think that in addition to new force generation from myocytes, that uh, there may be a change in the scar itself that might be induced by the fibroblast cells that get infected, but don't even fully reprogram, but might be fundamentally altered. And so maybe don't lay down as much uh, scar, collagen, et cetera. It's been very difficult to tease that apart, so I, we don't know yet what the relative contributions are to uh, new muscle, versus just uh, alteration of the scar in the system. But it's a great point. And is it possible that the other cardi cardiomyocytes, the mature cardiomyocytes, are able to handle the stress of the infarct better by having these transcription factors, or that there may be uh, adult progenitor cells that might be also responding to these factors? The, the existing myocytes don't take up these factors, and so they wouldn't be influenced. But it's possible that there are cardiac progenitor cells in the heart that we have yet a way to identify that uh, could be taking it up and reprogramming. We, we don't know how to mark those yet. Yes, oh, okay, over here, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, thanks. Um, do you know what would happen if you took human cardiofibroblasts and tried to reprogram those and put those in the mouse? Uh, I do, we've tried that as experiment. So I should say that uh, human cells, uh, we found in many forms of direct reprogramming uh, are much more difficult. And I think Marius Wernig has seen this as well in the neural system. Um, we, these same three factors don't reprogram human fibroblast. We've gone back and done a screen, and Jidong, Jidong Fu in our lab has uh, uh, found two additional factors that then can convert human cells to a certain degree. We have injected those cells uh, into mice, and we think that uh, uh, in vivo they appear to get more reprogrammed, but we're still working out the details of that. Uh, but it's been a lot harder in human cells. And that's true for skeletal muscle, and you'll hear later for smooth muscle as well. Thank yes. you for a wonderful talk. And uh, yeah, my question is that you mentioned that the retrovirus is only taken up by dividing cells. And also you mentioned that the microenvironment of heart is really important. And it, it promotes the direct reprogramming. So, Based on those factors, have you ever seen kind of the direct re giving three factors to different kind of mouse, mouse cell type, which is actively dividing, such as hepatocyte or epithelial cell? Because if you 
do not see any direct reprogramming from those cells, you may not need open chest surgery. You can just give three factors in kind of, yeah, with only simple injection. That is, yeah, one question. Another question is, yeah, what are the hurdles you actually move this technology to the clinic setting? Uh, so uh, we have uh, introduced these three factors into dermal fibroblast cells, and there they can reprogram uh, cells to a certain degree as well. In vitro, we, they never seem to reprogram as well as cardiac fibroblast cells, but in vivo, we can get cells that have developed sarcomeres in the tail. Uh, the tail doesn't start beating, uh, but, uh, <laughs> but we do get sarcomeric formation there. Um, and uh, there are uh, many hurdles still ahead, uh, particularly the delivery hurdle, uh, with gene, it's a real a gene therapy approach right now. We're pushing forward with that, but at the same time, we're screening for small molecules that could replace each factor uh, in the hope that someday we might be able to do it in a drug manner rather than gene therapy manner. Thank, uh, you. thank you very much for showing us such a beautiful, uh, fan fantastic result for the uh, mouse cell differentiation. Uh, I didn't read your paper carefully, but uh, when I listened to your talk, and uh, could you tell us how soon, once you inject those factors, four, three factors, and the fibroblast can become reprogrammed into the myocyte? That takes about how long? Three weeks or four weeks? So it's progressive. Uh, we've done some careful studies now going back temporally, and we can see uh, the switches starting to occur as early as three days in gene expression. The cell biology seems to lag behind that, and what's, I think one surprising res result we've had recently uh, that's not published is that uh, much of the transcriptome changes occur within the first three days. Uh, and then after that, it's fine tuning. Even though the cell biology progresses over weeks, we don't actually see uh, the, the action potentials, for example, uh, that I showed you until many, many weeks later. Uh, and uh, we don't see them at all earlier. So there's a gene expression shift, and then there's a cell biology shift. Okay, I, I also am very uh, curious about the time course for once the reprogram, and also I know the fibroblast compared to the myocyte, the size, a huge difference, and they t it must take time for them after the reprogram, growing into the same size. The beautiful slides you show us are almost the same size as pre-existing myocyte. And I would like to know, do you have a time cost showing the cells are beginning to grow in and, and finally reach this, the target size? We, we, we do have that result, and we, that's in the Nature paper we published uh, where we sacrificed the mouse at uh, one week intervals and could see the progression in vivo even. Okay, uh, final question. Uh, maybe uh, I'll take the uh, others uh, just for the sake of time. Thank you. Thank you, Deepak. That's a very nice presentation. I, I want to follow up a little bit on the size, but not on this regenerated muscle. But do you know what happens to the remote area? And so usually without regeneration, there'll be hypertrophy on that area. Do you know in, when you have regeneration in the scar area, do you uh, reverse the hypertrophy uh, that occur in the remote area? Or do these myocytes in the remote area continue to hypertrophy? And do you know anything about the fetal gene program in that remote area? Uh, there's, there's clearly still cardiac dysfunction, and so there, many of those same mechanisms are at play, including hypertrophy and fetal gene expression, uh, but there's just less dysfunction. So I think uh, all those are, are still uh, present. We're not obviously doing it at the level yet uh, through this delivery mechanism in, in mice to, to overcome all of those things. The hearts are still dilated, mm. uh, and, uh, but they're squeezing better, so their output's higher. Got it. Yes. Excellent work. Uh, you mentioned about the in vivo microenvironment and uh, reprogramming. Uh, so in adult, many stem cells uh, has specific niche uh, to function. Um, I, I want to hear you know, uh, if you have any uh, comment in terms of whether a suitable environment uh, present in the heart that show better uh, cardiomyocyte uh, reprogramming than uh, other regions in your in vivo experiments? If, if there are better environments than others? Y yeah. You, um, you know, we don't know yet. Uh, we haven't looked at a variety of different settings, uh, but I will say that we are now exploring whether or not the fibroblasts have to be activated after injury to actually reprogram, or could we do it in their quiescent state, say in a chronic model, uh, 
Uh, and so we're in the process of doing those experiments, but we don't know the answer as yet. Thank you very much for your attention.